thank you ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for being here and for your continued support for the U.S.-Ukraine relationship. And thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. Uh, still jet lagged from my third trip in five weeks to Ukraine and my days uh, in Kyiv uh, earlier this week. I don't have to tell this crowd that these are historic and challenging times for the people of Ukraine, for the Ukrainian-American relationship, and for people everywhere who care about the future of that great country. The world is watching the drama that is unfolding in the center of Kyiv. The Euromaidan movement has come to embody the principles and values that are the cornerstones for all free democracies. What began on November 24th as a protest against President Yanukovych's decision to pause on the route to Europe has become much deeper and bigger. When Ukrainians say they are European, this is what they mean. And as one very prominent Ukrainian businessman said to me, the Maidan's movement, movement's greatest achievement is that it has proven that the people of Ukraine will no longer support any president, this one or a future one, who does not take them to Europe. Secretary Kerry wasted no time in expressing the United States disgust at this decision of the Ukrainian government, and by morning the riot police had been forced to retreat. Later that same day, I spent more than two hours with President Yanukovych. It was a tough conversation, but also a realistic one. I made absolutely clear to him on behalf of the United States that what happened December 10th and more general, generally what has been happening in security terms is absolutely impermissible in a European state, in a democratic state. But I also made clear that the United States believes there is a way out for Ukraine, that it is still possible to save Ukraine's European future, and that that is where we wanted to see the president lead his country. And that was going to require immediate steps to de-escalate the security situation and immediate political steps to end the crisis and get Ukraine back into a conversation with Europe and with the International Monetary Fund. As you all know, and as I'm sure you just heard from Anders and other colleagues, Ukraine's economy is in a dire state, having been in recession for more than a year and with less than three months worth of foreign currency reserves in place. The reforms that the IMF insists on are necessary for the long-term economic health of the country. A new deal with the IMF would also send a positive signal to private markets and would increase foreign direct investment that is so urgently needed in Ukraine. Signing the association agreement with the EU would also put Ukraine on a path to strengthening the sort of stable and predictable business environment that investors require. There is no other path that would bring Ukraine back to long-term political stability and economic growth. As Vice President Biden said in remarks last night, President Yanukovych has a choice. He can choose the path that leads uh, to division and isolation, or he can take a leap and take immediate, tangible steps to defuse his country's crisis and start a genuine dialogue with the opposition and agree on a path that returns Ukraine to economic and political health. Since Ukraine's independence in 1991, the United States has supported Ukrainians as they build democratic skills and institutions, as they promote civic participation and good governance, all of which are preconditions for Ukraine to achieve its European aspirations. We've invested over $5 billion to assist Ukraine in these and other goals that will ensure a secure and prosperous and democratic Ukraine. What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Um, the the uh, Klitschko piece is obviously the complicated electron here, um, especially the announcement of him as deputy prime minister. And, and you've seen some of my notes on the troubles in the marriage right now. So we're trying to get a read really fast on where he is on this stuff. But I think your argument to him, which you'll need to make, I think that's the next phone call we want to set up, is exactly the one you made to, to Yachts. And I, I'm glad you sort of put him on the spot on where he fits in this scenario. And I'm very glad he said what he said in response. 
Good. So uh, I don't think Cleet should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess you think what, in terms of him not going into the government, just let him sort of stay out and do his political homework and stuff. I'm just thinking in terms of sort of the process moving ahead, we want to keep the moderate Democrats together. The problem is going to be Tony Book and his guys. And, you know, I'm sure that's part of what Yanukovych is calculating on all of this. Um, I'm I, kinda, I, I, just, I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week, you know. I, I, I just think Cleach going in, he's going to be at that level working for Yatsenyuk. It's just not going to work. Yeah, no, it, I, think that's, you know, I think that's right. Okay. Good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him as the next step? My understanding from that call, but you tell me, was that the big three were going into their own meeting and that Yats was going to offer in that context a, a three-way, you know, the three plus one conversation or three plus two with you. Is that not how you understood it? No, I think, I mean, that's what he proposed, but I think just knowing the dynamic that's been with them where um, – Klitschko has been the top dog. He's going to take a while to show up for whatever meeting they've got, and he's probably talking to his guys at this point. So I think you reaching out directly to him helps with the personality management among the three, and it, and it gives you also a chance to move fast on all this stuff and put us behind, you, behind it before they all sit down and he, um, he explains why he doesn't like it. Okay, good. I'm happy. Why don't you reach out to him and see if he wants to talk before or after? Okay, will do. Thanks. Okay, I've now written, oh, one more wrinkle for you, Jeff. Yeah. I uh, can't remember if I told you this or if I only told Washington this, that when I talked to Jeff Feltman this morning, he had a new name for the UN guy, Robert Seri. Did I write yeah. you that this morning? Yeah, okay. I saw that. He, he's now gotten both Seri and Ban Ki-moon to agree that Seri could come in Monday or Tuesday. Okay. So that would be great, I think, to help glue this thing and have the UN help glue it. And, you know, fuck the EU. No, exactly. And Breaking news. A leaked phone call reveals the same snipers were shooting at both protesters and police in Kiev. Our team's Marina Kossera joins us now live with more on this. Well, Marina, details where we know this from and who was behind those snipers then. Absolutely. Well, all this information is, in fact, becoming public after a phone conversation was leaked and is now accessible to everyone who wants to listen in, and it is on YouTube. And that conversation, in fact, is between the EU Foreign Chief Catherine Ashton and also we have the Estonian Foreign Affairs Minister. And Catherine Ashton, in that uh, phone conversation, is, in fact, asking him about his impressions of Ukraine, where he just returned from, and he said the picture is looking sad. And more importantly, and it's quite an eye you know, this one is the fact that snipers were, as you said, Marina, were shooting both at protesters and officials, both sides, really. So let's listen in to what he had to say. All the evidence shows uh, that people who were killed by snipers from both sides, among policemen and, and people from the streets, that they were the same snipers killing people from both sides. Well, that's, yeah. So that, and then she also showed me some photos. Uh, she said that has medical doctor. She can, you know, say that it is the same, same handwriting, the same type of bullets. And it's really disturbing that now the new, uh, new coalition that they don't want to investigate what exactly happened. So that there is now stronger and stronger understanding that behind snipers they were. It was not Yanukovych, but it was somebody from the new coalition. To a breaking news story this hour. The Estonian Foreign Ministry has said the leaked phone call between the EU's Catherine Ashton and the Estonian Foreign Minister is authentic. The conversation features staggering revelations, saying the snipers who were shooting at both protesters and police in Kiev were allegedly hired by someone from the former opposition.